So today, I'll very briefly take you through the function of the church, but we'll do it quarterly. The first function of the church is to worship. Worship is called Latreia. Latreia. L A T R E I R. Whose root meaning is service or ministry. And so it, it assumes the attitude to our church gatherings that we should only gather to worship the Lord. And so, what's the attitude to our church gatherings, uh, gatherings today? Because it should not be, what can I get out of this? We should not gather to ask ourselves, what can I get out of this? But how can I serve God in this? What can I give to God in this? Earlier on I've said that when looking at Acts chapter 2 verse 43 forward, 42 forward, all the way to 47, we see the acts of worship and what should accompany it. That it should be joyful and reverent. John Piper says that it should be gravity and gladness, not heavy and dull. When you come to church, don't have a heaviness or dullness, but be joyful, not silly and casual and flippant, but reverent. Remember who God is. God is to be revered. So what are we trying to do in our church? In our church services that is in our gatherings in particular what is purpose of Sunday morning services or teaching praise teaching enjoy a certain experience encourage one another evangelism all the above to some extent there are those who will say we go to church for teachings to praise to enjoy a certain experience, to encourage one another, or to evangelize, or to evangelize. All of this, yes, to some extent, but surely the main focus, which all the others stem from, is that we are meeting with God in Christ. And so anytime time we come here, we come to meet with God in Jesus Christ. Remember, he said in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except but through me. So nobody can see the Father except through Jesus. To delight in Him, to fellowship with Him, to know Him better, to be changed by Him, to pay Him homage, to, re to, to, to give Him reverence, respect, to submit to Him, to serve Him is actually what we are called to meet Him for. And of course, we do all this together, together with one another. We delight in Him together. We fellowship with Him together. Together get to know Him better. Together to be changed by Him. Together. So we are also building each other up. Also serving each other. But how do we know that what to do in our church gatherings? How do we know what to do on Sunday mornings? There are different approaches. Some say unless it is commanded, we cannot do it. And this is more of John Calvin's approach. This is a French man who wrote about the Westminster section of church. And that is, we can only do what is commanded. So John Calvin and the PCS, they normally say that we only do what is commanded for by God. They should not do what is not in the Bible, what is not reverent in the scripture. Others say, unless it is forbidden, we are free to do it. But all that which is forbidden, we are not free to do it. And this is more of Luther's approach. And this is where we get the Lutherans. And that is we can do whatever is not forbidden. They say anything which is not forgiven, forbidden we can do. 
But all that which is forbidden, we can't do it. So, can we light candles in church? Is there any way in the Bible where they say you don't light candles in the church? Should we have crosses on walls? Who would Calvin's way conclude? What would Calvin's way conclude? The Calvin's way would say no. We cannot have candles and crosses. Since these are not commanded in the scriptures because we won't find anywhere in the scripture whereby they say hang crosses on the walls. Since these are not commanded in the scriptures and the scriptures are sufficient and tell us how that we should do. But what would Luther's way conclude? Yes, we may have these things since they are not forbidden by scriptures. That's why you go in some churches and find them different to yours. It will depend whether they are going Calvin's way or Luther's way. Luther, Luther's way, that is met in Luther's way, is anything which is not forbidden, we can do it. Perhaps the approach I like best is a variation on Calvin. The church must have biblical word that is authority for the way she worships God such word can be derived from biblical commands, principles, or examples. Because then, when you do things because they are not forbidden in the Bible, instead of doing only that which is accepted for in the Bible, because for me I will go more of Calvin's way, So if we are commanded in Bible to do something when we gather, then we do it. An example is Paul wants prayers to be offered for all men in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge them, first of all, that requests prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to acknowledge, I mean to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Then clearly we pray in church gatherings. So if there is biblical principle, then we follow it. An example is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 to 28. We need to understand what is being said if we are to benefit. It talks of prophecy, tongues, and intercession. Then worship should take place in a language we all understand, not Latin and be translated for those who do not speak the language. When you fail to understand what will be the direction of your prayer, I think it is sometimes difficult to know when the examples in the Bible are to be followed, and when they are simply descriptions of what happened, without any point being made that we should follow them. But for example, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people were assembled as one man in the square before the waters again. They told us through the scripture to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. 
which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened care attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mativia, Shima, Anaya, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseya. And on his left were Pendaya, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So in Nehemiah 8, 1, 6, we see standing for the reading of scriptures. We have some churches, particularly some reformed ones, do this. There are those who will stand for the scriptures to be read. There are those who will sit. But at the end of the day, you can stand and get nothing. You can sit and get nothing. But main point, we are not free to worship God anyhow. We must worship God as He wants. We are not free just to say we are worshiping Him just because He is worshipped. When you read Amos, Amos, chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, Go to Bethel and sing, go to Gilgal and sing yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn live and bread as a dunk offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, from this is what for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you've not re returned to me, declares the Lord. Allow me to very quickly explain a little bit. Go to Bethel and sin. Bring live and bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. What is the problem in this scripture? There was one general problem. They were not worshipping where God had said they should worship. They were in Gilgal and Bethel. But they were supposed to worship where? At Jerusalem. But then, when Jeroboam took the ten upper parts, the northern kingdom, and left Jeroboam with the two, he blocked their way to going down to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, to southern kingdom, to Judah. Reason because they would be convinced by God, please, Leave that man come and rejoin with the other two tribes. They were not worshipping where God had said they should worship. Jeroboam built high praises, high places for worshiping Bethel, Gilgal, Dan. For God had said, worship in Jerusalem. That is in the southern kingdom. But Northern Kingdom had broken away from South, and so were worshipping in the cities in Northern Kingdom, instead of traveling to Jerusalem in South. When Jesus was born, remember how when he was 12 years, they took him to the temple, because it was Yom Kippur's section, time, the Day of Atonement. And so, 
Instead of traveling to Jerusalem in the south, people were not worshiping where God had commanded because they shunned. They stopped going to Jerusalem. And people not worshiping in the way God had prescribed, people worshiping in the way they thought or thought best, rather than the way God has said. I'm teaching you all these things because of the very many things you guys have gone through. There is nowhere God has said to go and have a big Goganisha and Usebe Umeomba. There is nowhere it is written that way. Lakini like, hata kukwambia mchanga na nikupake. Alipaka kipofu wabaya alikuwa kipofu in John chapter 9 and chapter 10 continues. But there are things which are unbiblical. Imagine when I could have said When we are in the church, we talk of light. Dani and Giza, Akuna Nuru. And we are going to be Akuna Nuru, Giza. You talk about it. Yeah, we go to Giza and we go to Giza. Why is it that you are going to be able to get a little bit of 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 a little
But then you see David akirukaruka bele ya ya the the hack of the covenant. How do we make the same mistake in our churches today? How are we too concerned to be people pleasing rather than God pleasing? Instead of your coming, I guide you to love and to know God. Jutaenda bila Mungu kile kitakusaidia ni juvi ni mafuta. Na uja kuja kanisani uende minus God. So when you unakuja hapa na napea kipao mbele mafuta, maji chumvi, inamaanisha I'm not helping you. The second specific problem was brag or boasting about their free will offerings. What is wrong here? Free will offerings supposed to be private affairs between worshiper and the Lord, but they were and they were to be given quietly, without fuss and fanfare and publicity. But the people were boasting or bragging about their giving. They wanted to receive praise from men. So worship was man glorifying rather than God glorifying. How do we make the same mistakes today? Of course, we do the very same thing with regards to giving. Who question of announcing giving? Jumapili liopita tulitoa elifu mianane, tulitoa lakitano, tulikuwa tulitoa lakitatu. How can you do this when the scripture clearly says we should not do it? Mark chapter 2 verse 41 to 44. Mark. Chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money in, into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the widows. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, she out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. So many rich people threw in large amounts. When we say draw in mean Loud noises, coins clapped. Eh? It's coins clapped. Remember that time, Makukwa and Anots? Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with the trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will want you. Do not announce with the trumpets to be honored by men. The point is not do not announce the trumpets. The point is do not announce to be honored by men. Again, the hard people say, but when we announce the amount, people give more. Exactly. Shows their reasons for giving wrong. But other examples of man glorifying rather than God glorifying, e.g. some testimonies, they claim to be glorifying God really glorify, but, in, but instead <coughs> glorifying men. You hear them say, I thank God he has enabled me to, to do this, to do that. And that is boast, boast, boast. And others, you have 
they have special numbers. Not about building half the congregation, but about displaying gifts and abilities. Another example is some preachers, all about display of their gifts, their knowledge. All about what they've done by their skill, even if, say, by God's grace. How many people they've converted? converted? How many people they've preached to? Each is some other, some worship leaders, they say it is their, about their gifts. It is about them looking as if having a great worship experience. It is about them looking spiritual. So the danger here is instead of worshiping God as he has said, in a way that pleases him and glorifies him, we organize our services to please ourselves and to glorify ourselves. So then, what should we do in our gatherings for worship? But the question is, what has God taught us he requires of us? What are the different elements of worship? Offering and praise, which is fundamental in, all, in both Old and New Testament writings. What we saw in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47, it includes both spoken and sung praise. When you read Ephesians 5 verse 18, Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Reading and preaching of the Word of God, Colossians 4.16 After this letter has been read to you, see that it is, it is also read in the Church of the Laodiceans. And that you in time, in time you read the letter from Laodicea. First Thessalonians 5:27. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The same you find in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and 1 Timothy 4, 13 to 16. Notice two corners of preaching Christ. Some sermons which do not mention him. Some sermons which a Muslim could preach each year and pride. Do not mean every sermon must have a simple gospel explanation. That is not usually four point gospel presentation. That is, would be opposed to that. Becomes empty, meaningless, perhaps gospel much bigger than that. The gospel is much bigger than that. But always preaching must be Christ descended. Surely, whether someone on prayer or sanctification or being par parent, always seen through the person of Christ. What God has done in him, who we are in him. So, what would a Christian sermon on pride include? And what are the reasons we should not be proud? E.g., because all we have comes from God in Christ as grace has given. Again, because God opposes the proud, because Christ humbled himself and he is our example, because we are all sinners. When we talk of offering of money, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 4, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, when we talk of prayer, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 forward, and baptism of the Lord's Supper, And so, be quick to notice use of word worship and how it has changed over the years. With a time of worship means nowadays, time of singing, with perhaps a little spoken prayer in as well. Tendency to think wrongly nowadays as follows. The most important thing we can do is worship God. Worship is singing and praising God, that's what many people think. So the most important part of the service, church time, is the singing. So does not, this does not matter. You find many does not see it matter. If not much time or energy or attention given to anything else. 
But the whole time of being together is worship. We acknowledge God, God's worship by listening to His word. We acknowledge His worship by coming to Him in prayer. We acknowledge His worship by giving money for His kingdom's work to be used as He has commanded. So, time of worship is the whole time we are together, not just the singing part. Because I've touched about singing, what's the word about singing? If congregation was singing, then make sure congregation can sing it. Too many modern worship songs today were written for professional musicians. Very hard to sing. Large range of notes, hard to know where the tune goes. And that's why I love simple songs. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretest of glory divine. A cause of mercy, a cause of love. So you find congregation or singing turns into a performance. With the congregation standing listening to others singing, they become an audience. To God be the glory gravings he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Is love in atonement for sin and praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let them hear the his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. So you find the way of mother. We can talk up on the same I'm quite lucky to believe, but still, I sing very well. Where did you sing? Uliana Kanisani wa Kuibi ama Ujibi. Nobody will worship God for you. That's why. Likaiba wimbo na likuta mujui na achana. If choosing songs, choose on basis of words, not just whether you like the music. There are those who, there are prayers which are confession, 
Sometimes saying a confession together, that's why we also do it. Reciting Apostles Creed. What's the value? We have two advantages. First of all, formal liturgy has good logic behind the order in which things are done. Are done. One is to call, call to worship. God gathers his people, he invites them to meet with him. Number two is the confession and the absolution, holy in service. It is good because when, when you come into God's presence, you must realize, like Isaiah, we are unclean. So we need to know, to know forgiven, to get forgiven. That's why in chapter 6 of Isaiah, he says, God, I, I am a man from unclean people and I am of unclean lips. Remember, I talked of one church, no mention of sin for 10 weeks. I was there. And remember, when we begin our services, we, we begin with the firstly, repentance. That's why we begin today also with the repentance. Reason because we are not holy, He comes to make us holy. Then there is in liturgy consecration. Consecration is affirmation of faith. Each year, a, a Prostos Creed, Nicene Creed, that is showing that we believe what Christians for centuries have believed, declaring our loyalty to God and to the truths of this gospel. Someone is listening to God's word, hearing what our God requires of us as his people, so we can do his will. And then we have communion, fellowship meal with our God. To strengthen us for the battles of the week, we have just begun. A means of grace as we get strength from this thing we done on Christ. Many churches have this each week. And why not? Main argument is that it would get meaningless. But I do not stop hugging people because it might get meaningless. Senior, you won't stop hugging. I, I should not stop hugging my children. Lakini kuna wa sime kuambia sometimes something in azoya mtu. But then, we unazoya kwa mtu tayo. And so again, we have the commission, that is the benediction, sending us out into the world with God's blessing upon us. Rather than closing the service with have a great week, much better is something like go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. And second advantage liturgy has good content. Many prayers that are just made up as go, as go along, very weak and in content can be very passionate and noisy, but not much truth and sense in them. But some say, unspiritual to plan what you say when pray. It is unspiritual to plan what you are going to say when you, you are praying. Should you just let spirit fill your mind? But why? Prepare sermons, why not prepare prayers? I will ask you an, an example. Do I not prepare sermons? I do. Can you also prepare a prayer? You can pray, prepare some points. Suppose we are going to go to the house. Then we are going to say, Lord, I worship you. Then we are going to say, Lord, I worship you. Then we are going to say, Lord, I Some of course say, well, we should not prepare sermons either. They say we do not need to prepare prayers or sermons. God will give us what to say. Mark 13 verse 11, he says, Do not worry before hard what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. But that is to take Jesus' words out of context. He is not here referring to preparation and delivery of sermons to the church. Mark 13, 11a, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry. In the context, it refers to a situation when you are on trial for your life, not preaching or praying with the people of God. Akini, you should not prepare. 
Lakini aliwaambia wakati mtakamatwa mbele kwa masinagogi msishidwe, msitafute kile mtaongea. Roho mtakatifu atawapea kile mtakachoongea. Is this a prison? I've been castigated here because of preparing these teachings. Nilikuwa nikuja hapa nianze kuendakaja kuambia chukua mawe mkono moja na ingine mkono wengine mngogeshe mwapo. Then unakuta hapa ile sauti inatoka hapo ni sauti inatoka mmoja na ile vumbi inatoka kwa mawe ikiongoganishwa. But back to the question of prayers, thought out prayers often much better balanced in content. If going to see president, plan beforehand what you are going to ask him for. And get congregation involved. Rather than they just listening to reading of Bible, long prayer of pastor and someone. Could have a mixture. Prayers that are written and we repeat them together. Prayers where a leader says he reads certain bits and we respond with the sentence or two. I'm talking about retention. And prayers where some are read and some spontaneous. Does not mean have all the same prayers every week, but prepared or thoughtful, theologically accurate and helpful prayers. What about the reciting of Creed ZTC? Again, the advantage of reminding ourselves of the great central truths of scripture helps to keep us balanced, helps to keep the basic truths central to our worship and minds, e.g. a pastor's creed. Note that some churches are horrified by the word liturgy, but notice they actually, those churches use liturgy. Prayers often cover the same content in the same order, in the same words, Week by week, content and form set by a habit and tradition. Just that not written down and no congregation or participation in these prayers, apart from the amen at the end. An example is that I went to church for a while where much emphasis on spirit led spontaneous prayers, but usually same five or six people prayed. In the same order for the same things. Yes, I want you to come. But you want to attend our meeting? We are going to have a good time. We are going to have a good time. But to them, they don't do liturgy. What's the difference? Many churches have fixed order of service, but often not a well thought out one. Men will have like two hymns, prayer, hymn, Bible reading, hymn, sermon, hymn, benediction. Reason like, need a hymn here so people can stand up and stretch before someone. Nothing wrong with that order of service. But was there any sense of reason why did, did it, did, they did it this way? And was there any thought about what sort of hymn suitable at various stages? There are those who will only think of increasing congregation or participation, which is very important. And this is through reading Bible passage together. You have your Bible, I say together, open chapter 2 of Mark, verse 1, and we read aloud. Sometimes we love responsive prayers, Lord's Prayer, perhaps one day read creed together or say confession. And so there are three characteristics of the worship of the church. One, the living Christ is present in our midst. We gather not to revere a memory, but to celebrate our presence, to rejoice in the victory of our Lord and to meet Him in the Spirit through the world. The Holy Spirit empowers the worship. He creates reality. 
First Corinthians chapter one, chapter twelve, verse three. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cast, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit empowers the worship. I've taught you the characteristics of worship. One is the living walk. Christ is present in our midst. Second is the Holy Spirit empowers the worship. He checks the unworthy instincts. First Corinthians 14 verse 32. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the Lord says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? Even one thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. It inspires. The Holy Spirit inspires prayer, Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself in the sins for us with groans that words cannot express. And he, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The Holy Spirit moves people to praise. Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk on the wine which leads to this debauchery instead be filled with the Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit leads into truth. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We've not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in the words taught us by human wisdom, but in the words taught by the Spirit expressing spiritual truths in the spiritual words. The Spirit of God in the church imparts His gifts. Romans 12, verses 4 to 8. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one, many, many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And also, <coughs> the Holy Spirit, as we are told in John 16, verse 8 and 1 Corinthians 14, 24, convicts believers. 
Number three, is, uh, the other characteristic of uh, worship of the church is a spirit of loving fellowship that pervades the congregation. A spirit of loving fellowship. Early Christian worship was marked by loving concern for fellow worshippers, not hate, not rejection, not fight, and not another thing which is besides that. On Sunday, I will begin a little section about the sacraments, which is part of the functions of the church. And you will understand what sacraments are. Sacrament is to do the sacrament that is devoted or dedicated usually to a deity or ordinances, what Christ ordained to be permanently observed or practiced by the church. I will answer you what a sacrament is, but briefly understand that it is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. Remember on Sunday I touched a little bit about the consubstantiation by the Pentecostals and the transubstantiation by the Catholic Church. And so, sacrament is an outward and invisible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And this is according to, you know, like for example, when you take uh, the, the host. Ile mkate, unaheza chukua mkate. Iyo mkate, pale paduka, uilete hapa. Kama ime pita all the specifics. Iyo mkate, it's visible. It is a sign which is seeable by everyone. But then, it is supposed to be there for an inward, invisible grace. Inward and invisible grace. About yule upako yule neema itaingia. Through the words about your coach kutamuka. Maana neno ni uhai. Kila kitu yote kiliumba na mungu kupitia neno. Yo tunaumba mapia maku. In it. Protestant churches have two such sacraments. The Anglican Catechism talks of sacrament as an outward and invisible sign of an inward and invisible grace. But Protestant churches have two such sacraments, baptism and Lord's Supper. Or the bath and the bread, the, the, the bath and the bread, as Luther called them. You get bathed and you get, uh, you know, fed with the body of Christ. Notice what accompanies the sacraments. Baptizing in Matthew 28, 20 and teaching. 1 Corinthians 11, 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Baptizing goes along with the teaching. Communion is proclaiming. And so sacraments are visible words of God. That's according to Augustine of Hippo. Sacraments are of the gospel. They are to point us to Christ and his death and resurrection for sins. And so we will see all those. Part of the sacraments beginning with the baptism. We see all of them. So I think because of time, we can pick it from there, is it? Amen. How many people have understood? All of us? Amen. To smile to our Buddha.
Lord, my Savior, I worship you. May your name be adored and glorified and praised forever, Lord. For you are God. Your goodness and mercy, Lord, adores us. Shower us with your love and with your glory and your grace, Lord. May you decrease in us as we decrease. Lord, you are faithful. Let your faithfulness unto our lives reign forever. In Jesus' name. Amen.